Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host with me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. <sighs> hello to each and every one of you. That's a lot of you. Yeah. Which we're very, well, that's why I surmised it into one sentence. We're I'm, very I thankful for I that. I can't name every listener. No. I mean, unless you Go. Want me to. Do it now, though. Go. Uh, Brian uh, <laughs> Starfleet. <laughs> no. Uh, oh. Okay. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double, and a Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Episode 101. You know what that means? We have, we've done uh, over 100 episodes. That's exactly what it means. That's exactly That's, what You it nailed means. it, Mike. And for our 100th episode, we oh, did our live show. Like what a, what a way to do it. Holy crap. Like, talk about serendipity. Like, every, the timing of everything just worked out so great. It was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was incredible. We got to hang out with... Uh, Almost 400 of our <laughs> closest friends. And you almost all stuck around to get uh, photos with us after right? too. Oh my God, that was so amazing. We made the staff of the Rio quite angry with us. I think there was one guy with a leaf blower. <laughs> I'm trying to remember who was I talking to. I was talking to somebody who had overheard uh, the staff, I guess as they m met us and were leaving near the end. Oh, I think it was Martin. He overheard the like staff, one, one person like, God, fuck, could they just hurry up or something? And then, I'm and then somebody else who maybe ran into it, it was like, no, no, their fans are meeting with them. Let them, let them do it. Yeah, exactly. And it's a good thing for them all. So we had a good time and it was, oh my it God. was an amazing time for me anyway. Like, yeah. It's, it's, it's gonna, it's on my list of like top events in my life, you know, when you compare it to like having kids and stuff, like it's one of those things that yeah. you'll, I'll, I'll remember. Those, yeah, I understand those have to come first, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you don't have kids, so you don't. You can... That was my kid. Yeah. That, <laughs> was, that oh. was me having kids. You birthed it. I birthed a live show. It was a natural birth. No, I was on drugs. Oh yeah? No, not really. Yeah. Did you have a spinal tap? No. Or epidural or whatever they call it. Well, let's get to our show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to hear to do that. Yeah. We can't just gush about how awesome our live show was, or we could. I think we could, but we shouldn't. We shouldn't. Yeah. This week, we're headed all the way back east to Newfoundland and Labrador, specifically oh. to St. John's, the capital of Newfoundland. I love their warts. St. <sighs> John's wart? Yeah. It's it's not even wart as in W-A-R-T, it's St. John's wart as in W-O-R-T. Yeah, well. I, okay. It sounded the same and I still love it. This one is actually quite sad. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, brain on my it, parade. Yeah, it's quite sad. On the evening of the 14th of December in 1981, 14-year-old Dana Bradley, a grade nine student at I.J. Sampson Junior High School, left her friend's home after a brief visit. Dana was on her way home and excited to help celebrate her mom's birthday. 
She was last seen hitchhiking on Topsail Road, where witnesses saw her getting into a car, which drove off east. Mm. Four days later, Dana's body was found 14 kilometers southeast of the city in a remote wooded area off Maddox Cove Road. She'd been sexually assaulted, then struck and killed with a blunt object that had fractured her skull. This is Who Killed Dana Bradley. Yeah, this is not, this is sad already. Is, yes. We've had a lot of requests to cover this case mm. over uh, our existence. Mm -hmm. People started right away sending this case in. Oh, really? Eh? Yeah, so it's been on our list for a while. As well as using newspapers and other news organizations, much of our research into this particular case comes from Darren McGrath's book called Hitching a Ride. Oh, okay. And its subtitle is The Unsolved Murder of Dana Bradley, mm. so we're giving it away that it's unsolved. It's a quick read with lots of interesting inside information on Dana's life, death, and the investigation that followed. It's out of print, so you can't order it directly from Amazon, but we'll provide a link in the show notes to help if you're interested. Oh, cool. Um, typically, we've avoided unsolved murder cases, as we don't see ourselves as investigators. Yeah. But we're starting to see that talking about what is known about a case just might help jog someone's memory about it. This particular case is coming up on 38 years old, and it still generates a lot of interest nationally. Yeah, that, that's the important thing about, it. you're right, um, I don't get a lot of satisfaction out of unsolved cases in the sense of, I, I like there to be completion, Yeah. but yet the light we can bring to it. Exactly. It can help, and so there's something powerful about doing them. Yeah. Canada's easternmost province, Newfoundland, is also known as The Rock. It joined Canadian Confederation on March 31st, 1949, and was renamed Newfoundland and Labrador very recently. It was a British colony from 1583 and a self-governing dominion from 1907. Oh. Almost 89% of the residents of the province are of European ancestry and the rest are comprised mostly of indigenous groups and a small number of visible minorities. Some interesting stats and info there. Yeah. Um, I've never been to Newfoundland personally, but I know a lot of Newfoundlanders and mm -hmm. I love them. Mm -hmm. Um, I know your wife, Joanna lived in Newfoundland for a brief period of time. Yeah. I don't know for how long, maybe, I think, I think it was maybe two years or so, two or three because years. Because her ex-boyfriend was going to school there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We won't have to, we won't talk about that any yeah. further. Yeah. There are many jokes about Newfoundlanders in Canada, and perhaps as their accents make them seem, quote, simple. Yet, some of the smartest people I've met are Newfoundlanders. Some of the ones that I can think of right off the top of my head are journalist Gwyn Dyer, comedian Rick Mercer, oh. and Hockey Night in Canada's Bob Cole. Okay. Newfies themselves, perhaps to keep us all guessing and perpetuate the myth, seem to be the most prolific tellers of Newfie jokes. Here's one of my favorites. Oh, oh, okay. A Newfie rolls into his factory job at 10.30. The floor manager comes up to him and says, You should have been here at 9 o'clock. To which the Newfie responds, Why, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I love that joke. Oh, you would. Yeah. Newfoundlanders enjoy a reputation as some of the friendliest, most kind and generous folks on the planet. A large group of American travelers, unable to land back in the U.S. on September 11, 2001, mm -hmm. learned firsthand about Newfie hospitality. Yes, they did. Their planes were diverted to Gander for an indeterminate stay after the skies over their country were shut down during the horrific events of that day. Mm -hmm. Many were welcomed into the homes of the locals. Strangers or not, these Americans were fed and housed out of pocket by the kind Newfoundlanders. Many of these Americans still talk of the extraordinary kindness that was extended to them for those few days, and some have become lifelong friends of their hosts. Yeah, well, a very emotional time, and so to uh, have such wonderful people welcome you yeah. and provide you with safe relief is, uh, I, I can imagine, some pretty strong friendships built from that. So we're getting a feel for what kind of people mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about. Very sensitive, kind people. They love community. They love each other. Yeah. So when something like this happens, it really hits them hard. Yeah, yeah. St. John's Newfoundland is not to be confused with St. John, New Brunswick, that has no apostrophe S at the end. The explorer John Cabot first landed in the harbor on the morning of June 24th, 1497, which was 
the feast of St. John the Baptist. Thus, mm. that's why they call it St. St. John's. John's ever since. Hmm, what can we learn in since the early 80s, the population of St. John's hovered around 100,000 people. Okay. And it shrunk for a time during years after the moratorium on cod fishing in uh, the summer of 1992 and recession that followed a few years later. Because uh, that's one of their key yeah, resources. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it makes sense. It, it, it was at the time. I, I believe that now natural gas is a big thing. And likely tourism. Yeah. Many Newfoundlanders were forced to leave their homeland and seek their fortunes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Many in the oil fields of Alberta, lots went to Ontario, specifically Toronto. Yeah. St. John's, even as the provincial capital, is a small city, as we mentioned. The province is sparsely populated, so when one of their own is hurt or killed, it cuts deep. Yeah. Very small town-esque. Yeah. And the thought that one of their own might be responsible is to use a Newfie phrase, not said lightly... What a sin. Mm -hmm. You remember when we talked about Samantha Walsh, you weren't here for that one. That yeah, was Carol and, and yeah. I. It was a very similar feel to this episode about mm. how people reacted afterward. Mm -hmm. The story of Dana Bradley is one of The Rock's greatest unsolved mysteries. Dana Bradley was a pretty, smart, creative, and popular girl. She had blonde hair and blue eyes, and she smiled a lot. No. She was five foot five and weighed about 110 pounds. In Dara McGrath's Hitching a Ride, her homeroom teacher, Glenda Cluett, said Dana was an excellent student and always, quote, classily dressed. Oh. In the same book, a fellow student said, Dana was always friendly. She was helpful and would lend her notes to people who had missed classes. She was popular but not snobby. She had lots of friends throughout the three levels of the student body. So it was grades seven, eight, and nine in junior high school back there. Yeah, and, and that's not an easy uh, thing to achieve at that age in, in school year is being uh, balanced out friends-wise. You're usually either feel like you're an outcast or you're a popular one. So it sounds like she just got mm -hmm. along with everybody. Her parents, William and Dawn, had broken up. Dana was living with her mom and her mother's fiancé, Jeff Levitz, at 160 Patrick Street in mm -hmm. St. John's. Of course, at 14, Dana's interest in boys and parties had begun. Mm -hmm. She'd even been a bit rebellious, throwing a huge party when her mom was out once, but nothing unusual. Yeah. She got in big trouble for that. Yeah, I, I mean, we've all... Yeah, so did my sister and yeah. myself. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Not me, Mike. <laughs> Dana was the kind of kid, you know, living the life that most of us have. Growing pains are pretty normal. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. On the day Dana disappeared, she didn't walk the less than a kilometer home after school. Dana and her pals had taken up hitchhiking to get around. They'd stick out their thumbs in the hope of some friendly soul picking them up and dropping them off as close to their destination as possible. Hitchhiking was not seen as, as much of a dangerous activity in those days, at least not by the kids doing it. Mm -hmm. Although parents often didn't approve, it wasn't a no-no like it is today. Yeah. I personally hitchhiked all over Lunenburg County in Nova Scotia to get around when I was a teen. Did you? I've never hitchhiked in my life. I loved it. Really? I had a few strange experiences yeah. with rides, but I never had a real issue. Hmm. Yeah, so, I've never, never done it. Never done it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it was some weird. I, yeah, I can People imagine. Would pick you up. <laughs> Which is why they say don't. Yeah. That afternoon, Dana and a friend named Terry and a girl named Penny Cobb hitchhike first to Terry's house to drop her off. Dana and Penny then walked to the Cobb home on Curry Place, which was nearby. Mm. It was just over four and a half kilometers southwest of Dana's home. So, you know, within the city, very yep. close. Yep. Penny was upset. Her boyfriend had dumped her. Mm. And Dana came back to Penny's place to call the boy on Penny's behalf. She wanted to try and reunite the pair. Well, it'd be a mediator of sorts. Exactly. Wow. You know, girls do that for each other. The, you know, Penny really still loves you, Bobby. You should be nicer to her. Yeah, that's... Uh, Don't, did you... Yeah. No, I never had anybody. No? No. Well, I, you know, I never really broke up with anybody in those days. So oh. It would it, it'd be more like, she doesn't want to see you anymore, Scott. <laughs> Someone else would tell you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Why were they afraid of your reaction? Probably the crying. <laughs> You know, that's it's not inaccurate. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's good. I'm not really sorry. No. 
At 5 p.m., Dana spoke with her maternal grandmother on the phone to let her know that she'd be home in time for supper and to celebrate Dawn's birthday. After the usual I love yous, Dana hung up and left the cop's house and headed for home. Mm. She walked down the short cul-de-sac, made a right on busy Topsail Road, and stuck her thumb out at cars as they passed near a bus stop. According to McGrath's book, Dana was wearing a blue sweater, jeans, and cowboy boots, and over the sweater, a blue jacket with navy stripes on the sleeves. Okay, very identifying. Yeah. She had her school books tucked under her left arm and hitchhiking with her right. <sighs> From Hitching a Ride, quote, Around 5.20 p.m., a rusting car thought to be either a mid-1970s Dodge Dart or Plymouth Valiant, tan or faded yellow in color, stopped for the young hitchhiker. Dana was seen approaching the car. She tried the handle on the passenger side, but the door refused to open, as if some unseen force was trying to warn off the youngster and prevent her from entering the death trap. The driver leaned across the front seat and opened the door from the inside. It swung open and Dana got in, the rusting car headed east on Topsail Road toward the Village Mall. Dana vanished. Oh, End man. quote. My heart instantly, like you just know. You can see. Yeah. You could probably picture your daughter getting into a car. Uh, and that's. You know, just yeah. totally feeling like it's a harmless thing. Well, I, I can, I more so can picture me at that, at that age in that time. Oh, yeah. You know, I did uh, get into strangers. Yeah, cars. well, exactly. But I, I could yeah. see, uh, you know, and just knowing, yeah, the outcome of her. But it was a different time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah uh, completely. When Dana had not shown up for supper, her mom was concerned. Yeah. It wasn't like her. It was not like her at all. Yeah. Dawn waited until around eight thirty before she decided to go and start looking for Dana at the places she thought that she might be. Village Mall was open late for Christmas hours, so Dawn took one of Dana's school pictures there to show it to the shopkeepers and other folks in the hope that someone had seen Dana there that evening. Yeah. Nobody had. Dawn returned home and called as many of Dana's friends as she could think of. When Jeff Levitz, her fiancé, arrived home, the two of them went out looking for Dana all over town in every nook and cranny they knew she'd hung out at. Nothing. Oh, that, again, I've said it before, but I can't imagine a fear worse. Mm -hmm. Where's my kid? We lost a violet in the mall once. Yeah. And, and which is like just, you know, like not, I, I can't compare, but just those five minutes of running through the mall screaming. Yeah. It, it, I can only. How old was she at the time? <sighs> Six, oh, that's five, yeah, maybe, that's yeah, maybe, young. yeah, probably about five, and so it's, it's, so I, I take that fear and then just uh, expand it to, well, to, yeah, to hours, hours and days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Don called police. They weren't helpful that night. Oh, it kills me. They had to wait the twenty-four hours to file a missing persons report. Dana didn't show up for school the next day, so Dawn went back to the police who were now ready to help as the requisite time had passed. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm i so torn in regards to the 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. Um, if your kid is missing, mm -hmm. it's preposterous. Right. Get my kid now. Right. But also recognizing that if there was no, like if, if there was no, it's only a small percentage of kids who don't turn up. Our police force would be bogged down. Yeah. Just doing nothing but searching for, for missing kids. And most of it would be completely unwarranted. Yeah. So I, I, I try, I'm trying to be objective and see both sides. But I, yeah, I mean, if my kid is missing and I know my kid. Yeah. And, and, and I know her behavior and her patterns and, and she's missing. And I... And I'm and I'm trying to get help to not find that help. Yeah, would just like, whew. I bet you every parent says that though. I uh, know yeah, my kid. No, I, I know they wouldn't. I agree. Yeah, that's the tough thing. I'm trying to be objective. I'm yeah. trying to be objective. Yeah. But um, but yeah, in your in the situation, you're gonna say those things and you'll believe those things. It, if your kid had wandered off, say you had a big fight, and she said, "I'm running away." Yeah. Okay, kid wandered off. You. <laughs> You hope that she's going to come home within the next day. Yeah. And then when she doesn't, you go and 
and call the police, but that wasn't this situation. No, this was trying to get home. Yeah. Yeah. On Wednesday morning, December 16th, 1981, almost two days since she disappeared, Dana's picture and description were on the front page of both the local newspapers. Mm. People who'd seen Dana on the night she disappeared, or hopefully since, were urged to call the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. Oh. So it's the provincial police force. Constabulary. Constabulary. Police and volunteers began searching the city and surrounding areas, but there was no sign of Dana. Mm -hmm. On Thursday morning, the papers carried more information about Dana Bradley and more photos of the missing girl. Her mother was beside herself with worry, and neighbors and friends were very concerned as well. Mm -hmm. Parents and the school's principals began to warn teens away from hitchhiking. On the afternoon of Friday, December 18th, the answer to Dana's whereabouts came. It was not at all the happy ending that everyone was praying for. St. John's residents Helen and Dale Smith and their children, including a set of four-year-old twin boys, were looking for the perfect Christmas tree in a remote wooded area just off Maddox Cove Road. Dale wandered away from the family, thankfully, at around 3 p.m. and discovered Dana's body about half a mile from the road. Oh, my God. Oh. According to Hitching a Ride, Dale later told a news reporter, quote, I went walking off to the left. I saw, well, at first I thought it was a mannequin. All I saw were her legs. She was wearing jeans and was lying on her back. I went back and told my wife. I never looked at her face, but my wife did, and she recognized her as the girl who was missing. We ran into another fellow who was cutting wood, and he stayed with the body. We took our children back to the car, and we went back home together. I called 911, and the police came right away, end quote. Oh, and it's crazy to think, too, like, we're so used to current day and current technology when you would have just grabbed your cell phone right there and called yep. but that availability so no. like you, you, you have to go to either a, a pay phone a yeah, business yeah. Or a, a house that's nearby but it's a quite it was quite a remote area at yeah. the time yeah wow that's just, yeah and the trauma for that husband and wife yeah and to hope see that. and thankfully the children didn't have to see it because but they still would have experienced the, the impact parent, on yeah, the parents and that's so right it still would be very traumatizing dale showed the members of the royal newfoundland constabulary where he had found the body and by 3 30 p.m the area was cordoned off as a crime scene the rcmp became involved quickly yeah according to hitching a ride when the 911 call from dale came in don bradley was at the police station the cops didn't tell Dawn what was going on, but she knew in her heart it was bad news. Mm -hmm. She followed the police in her own car as they raced to the scene, but she lost them at a light. She and Jeff finally made it to the area where police cars were keeping the public at a good distance away from the actual scene, yeah. blocking yeah. them from going up the road. For sure. Yeah, we've seen that many times. Yeah. Dawn identified herself and asked whether the body of a girl had been found. She was told to go back to her car and someone would contact her soon. Some folks get upset with police for keeping parents and family members away from crime scenes, but there are a few reasons that yes. they do this. Yes, yes. They're trying to protect the family from the trauma of seeing a loved one where their murderer yes. has dumped them. They are preserving the crime scene from contamination to better preserve evidence that will be important later. Yes. And also the body might not even be the loved one that the person is expecting to see. Yep. And, and I get it. I get it. Again, you know, if I'm the parent, I want to see my kid. I don't care. But I, I get that the, um, the crime scene. It, it doesn't make it any easier knowing all these factors. No. Because the parent just wants, where is my child? You, you, want, to, you want to go and hold your child. Yeah. But, but again, like that, if... I wrote here, I can't fathom the thoughts and feelings that go with yeah. imagining that your child is laying somewhere out of reach, deceased in the woods. But if we want the perpetrator caught, yeah, we need that crime scene. Yeah, and that's the last thing a parent is thinking about uh, at that moment. Abso I, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I'm pretty sure almost every parent who has to go through this, after the fact, they're able to reconcile that portion. They're able yeah. to reconcile because it's like, well, had I come uh, and touched the body... Um, 
li lied on the ground, I'm contaminating the scene, and that could really complicate finding who did it. And, you know, so uh, as difficult as it is, I, I get that rule. Mm -hmm. I, I get it. Yeah. Makes sense. Police informed Don and Jeff that it was a girl's body that had been found, but they didn't tell them who it was yet. Yeah. They went home and were told soon after that it was indeed Dana and that it appeared that she had met with foul play. <sighs> Dana's family, friends, and the rest of Newfoundland were devastated. The cops went to work trying to figure out who could have done this, and we will take a break right here. Whew, I need it. And we're back. At around 7 p.m., an ambulance drove up Maddox Cove Road through the police barrier. Soon after, it came slowly back down the road and headed towards St. John's. Dana Bradley's body was inside. From an article in the Telegram written by reporter Barb Sweet on December 14, 2011, quote, Retired I.J. Sampson's junior high school principal Fred Talk was getting ready to head out to chaperone a dance at Dana's school on the evening of December 18, 1981, when news of a body being found came on TV. I was just going through the door when CBC blasted the news, he said this week. I said to myself, holy hell, and took off. Talk thought it was too late to cancel the dance, and in those days when teachers filled whatever role was needed, they all arrived at the school to handle the grief, speaking to the students in small groups. Mm -hmm. I think that it was the start of the shock, he said, adding, the first few days after Dana didn't return, everyone still held hope it was kidnapping that would end in a rescue, end quote. <sighs> oh. I I'm glad I've never had to experience something like that while, while in school. Your your wife did. This is true. But uh, I don't think it was, um, like, I don't think the whole school had to, uh, everybody get pulled together and have grief counseling and whatnot. Um, but I could be wrong. Yeah. She didn't mention that in our show. I didn't yeah. ask her about that, but. Um, it, in, it, in, you know, but in, she in, talked about it. still is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Listen, even, even, it still is even for her, like, mm -hmm. uh, quite emotionally impactful. Yeah. So can you imagine Especially in a tiny, in a tiny school, a small, yeah, a small uh, yeah, area. I, like, that's where I come from. That every, kind of yeah. place. So. Yeah. So everything, you know, everybody knows everybody. And, yeah. Police searched for clues in the area where Dana had been found. They used propane heaters to thaw the frozen ground to aid them. Mm. Surveillance of the roads to and from were set up for a few hours with the hope that the perpetrator would return to ogle the results of his handiwork. Yeah, which is quite common. No such luck, though. God damn it. It was a young man named Harry Beaton and his brother John who'd been selling Christmas trees nearby who had seen Dana hitchhiking around 520 in front of the bus stop mm. on Topsail Road. They watched her get into the car as described previously and saw it drive off. They were able to provide police with a description of the lone occupant of the car as well. The description of the Caucasian male reads... Age 25, height 5 foot 7 inches approximately, slim build, dirty blonde to brown, messy hair, unkempt, cow lick, collar length possibly balding, light to fair complexion, small features, eyes could be hazel. The car was a rusted four-door 73 to 76 Dodge Dart or Plymouth Valiant. It was described as faded yellow, tan or at some points even lime colored. Harry Beaton said in a phone interview with the Telegram newspaper, quote, I wish we had the wherewithal to get a license plate number, but at the time it was a different place. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you were to try to recollect and document everything that made you feel uneasy in the moment. Yeah. Uh, you'd, you'd be <laughs> taking a lot of notes. Yeah, exactly. So Not it, to make light of it, but it, it's... But just you know. to, to understand where they're coming from, because I'm sure they felt a lot of guilt. Uh, afterwards, and it, it's like you couldn't have expected yeah. this would be the outcome. Right now, we have a dash cam, for yeah. example, and it's voice controlled, so I, I tell it to yep. save the video when I need it to. And I've done that a few times. I'll see something weird around the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and I'll tell it to save the video just in case. Yeah. I like, agree. I see some guy lurking in the bushes by our complex. Like, that's never good. No. When's a bush I, lurking? And I have seen it. Yeah. 
And so I've slowed right down and made sure that the camera got them really good. And then, good. Yeah, but nothing's ever come of it. But no. at the same time, maybe one day it will. Another couple came forward claiming they'd seen a man in a car leaving Maddox Cove Road on the evening mm -hmm. that Dana disappeared. They didn't get a license plate number either. However, with the help of all these witnesses, a composite sketch was drawn of the suspect with the disclaimer, quote, not to be construed as an exact likeness, end quote. Okay. A Daily News article published on December 21st, 1981, told the story. The headline read, quote, Dana Bradley died of a blow or blows to the head. Police are looking for a murderer. <sighs> In the article, RCMP Inspector Jack Lavers, who has been instrumental in the search to find Dana's killer, told the paper that Dana's body had been autopsied on the day after she'd been found. Lavers said, quote, Death resulted from a skull fracture caused by what appears to be a blow or blows to the head by a blunt instrument. He went on to say, Death would appear to have followed the injury almost immediately. Wow. Must have been a pretty impactful blow. Yes, just brutal. Or blows, yeah. She had also been sexually assaulted, but that was held back at the time. There has not been much more detail given about Dana's autopsy in the ensuing years. Oh, interesting. So there must be some evidence. That they're there, holding back, mm -hmm, yeah. That only they know. Mm -hmm. How Dana's body was posed after her death was interesting to investigators, and they believe it told them a lot about the perpetrator. Well, absolutely, yeah. If there's one thing I learned from John Douglas... Yeah. It's how the body was treated after, uh, uh, after death. Like Danny, Danny Rowling. Yep. The things that he did, the mm -hmm. games, the Gainesville Ripper. Yep. He's an extreme example of somebody who did awful things. To yeah. Him. Yeah. But if, if somebody's remorseful, mm -hmm. they're going to position the body very differently than if somebody is not. So we'll get into that. Yeah. Dana was fully clothed. She was lying on a hill that overlooked Maddox Cove Road, and her feet were pointed directly toward the road. She'd been laid out burial style, with mm. her arms folded across her chest. Mm. Dana's school books were carefully tucked under her arm. The only damage visible to her body was a broken jaw. Everything else appeared neat and tidy. Interesting. In Hitching a Ride, Inspector Jack Lavers is quoted as saying, The way her body was laid out in the woods was unique, in the sense that usually the killer has no respect or regard for the victim, and usually the body is dumped in the woods or a ditch, not laid out as carefully as this body was laid out, with her books replaced under her arms. It indicated to me and other investigators that there was some level of remorse on the part of the person who put her there. Yeah, my, my gut tells me... Um with what little I know, probably somebody she knows or has a, ge a general, uh, uh, some kind of small connection to her at the least. Police thought that for a time, but hmm. have waffled back and forth on that. They're yep. not, they're yep. not sure about that. Uh, okay. There were no signs of a struggle. Nothing indicated that the attack that had killed Dana had happened where she had been found. There was no blood spatter. Mm, okay. There were no defensive wounds that would have indicated Dana fought her attacker or attackers. Police believed entirely that only a single person would have been able to bring her as far into the woods as she was. Mm. The feeling was that Dana could have been laying out there in the woods since the night she disappeared. The cool weather preserved her body at the time, and the short timeline should have provided police with more information had it been there to find, but there was nothing. Yeah. Nothing that's ever been made public, at least. Yes, good point. Human hair was recovered from Dana's body, and it was carefully preserved, and this would play a role in later years of the investigation as DNA evidence made its way into the forensic investigator's toolbox. Yes, no kidding. That was a question I was having in my mind. Is there anything? Dana's funeral was held on December 21st, 1981, at Wesley United Church, only blocks from the duplex where she lived with her mom on Patrick Street. After a brief assembly at her junior high school, the students solemnly made their way to the church for the ceremony. Reverend Robert H. Mills was the minister presiding and spoke of the community's sorrow, grief, and anger over the loss of someone so young in such a senseless way. I was stricken by this minister's name as I was baptized by a Reverend Robert Mills in oh. the United Church in Bridgewater in 1970. 
And he'd left there in the late 70s. Oh, interesting. This could have been the same man. I called mom and dad to confirm, but they were unsure whether it was the same Reverend Mills, but how many people named Bob Mills could have been acting as ministers in Atlantic Canada in the United Church? Oh, I'm thinking not many, Mike. <laughs> A minimum uh, 30. So isn't that weird that it's, here's that's another... Another connection. Yeah, like that possible man, connection. That man held me in his arms. Yeah, and is now presiding over... Yeah. Isn't that weird? Case we're covering, yeah. He's retired in Halifax. Uh, Bob Mills is still alive. And he recently lost his wife, Helga, only a few weeks ago, Mom oh, told no. me. So our condolences to Reverend Mills and his family and friends. Yeah, absolutely. That's sad. Dana Bradley was buried in a local cemetery as her family and friends wept. A plaque commemorates her there. It reads, Dana Nicole Bradley, aged 14 years. July 24th, 1967 to December 14th, 1981. The inscription below her details says, To live in the hearts of those we leave behind us is not to die. No. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. There were reports of a green four-door 1973 Impala or Bel Air seen driving back and forth on Maddox Cove Road on the day before Dana was found. Mm. Investigators were looking for a second person of interest. 25 years old, with bushy hair down over his ears. He was wearing a denim jacket, dark sunglasses, and he had a mustache. Police didn't say how this man might be connected, if at all. Uh, you know, it's not, if you're not a car person, it's not beyond the realm of possibility to confuse an Impala or, or Bel Air at that time mm. to a Dart. Maybe. I, I yeah. mean, they're, I, could, I know those cars, so I know they, they're fairly different, but, yeah, you know. In hitching a ride, Inspector Laver said early on, quote, we haven't arrested or questioned what we would feel to be a key suspect, end quote. Mm. Although with the witnesses, they were confident that they would solve the crime early on. Yeah. From the article in the Telegram written by reporter Barb Sweet on December 14th, 2011, quote, some 2,000 cars matching the description of the suspect vehicle were examined by police. 1,000 men questioned and hypnosis used to gain a better description of the suspect, end quote. Okay. So they put a lot of effort into this over yeah. the years. Weeks after Dana's murder, Dawn Bradley wrote a thank you note, which was published in the Telegram. She expressed her gratitude for the outpouring of love the family had received and told of more than 600 sympathy cards that had come from all over the province. Oh, that's very kind. Cops began to look at faraway places like Alberta and Toronto, Perhaps the perpetrator had been a man who had just left to look for work elsewhere, if you know what I mean. Yeah. In other words, escaping. But yeah. many Newfoundlanders leave every day to go do just that. So yeah. maybe he left in that group. Yeah. Or maybe that person could have been, quote, home from away, visiting family for the Christmas holidays and have returned west after Dana's murder. That's a possibility. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There were some other missing persons cases that have eerie similarities to Dana's murder. Oh, no, really? Yeah. I've summarized the following from a CBC article we'll link to in the show notes. Three years before Dana turned up dead on midnight, December 29th, 1978, 17-year-old Sharon Drover had just finished her shift at McDonald's. She hitchhiked home and was picked up by two brothers who dropped her off in front of her apartment at a boarding house on Livingstone Street in Longs Hill. The men saw her arguing with someone near the front door of the house where they dropped her off. She was later spotted running nearby and never seen again. <sighs> Almost a year after Dana's death, police were no closer to solving her murder than they had on that first day. On December 11th, 1982, three days before the first anniversary of Dana's murder, Henrietta Millick disappeared. Henrietta was a 25-year-old Inuit woman whose goal was to become a nurse. It was believed that Henrietta had a run-in with two unidentified men at a local night spot called the Key Club. Mm. They believed she was last seen on foot near the Trans-Canada Highway heading toward Conception Bay. Her keys, purse, and other personal items were later found at the club, leading people to believe she left the club against her will. Yeah, because you're, you're not going to leave those things behind willingly. But what are you seeing? You're seeing a pattern here. Absolutely. December, December... December. Yeah. The, uh, the age fluctuates. Age fluctuates. But, um, yeah, that's not it's interesting, crazy right? uncommon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
they're all they are all hitchhiking. Yep. In some way, walking yeah. along a highway. But there's another one. Oh, great. On November 12, 1984, 20-year-old Pamela Asprey was last seen getting into a large dark-colored car near the War Memorial on Duckworth Street with an unknown male at the wheel. She'd left her wallet with a friend at Aaron's Pub saying she'll be back in 20 minutes, and she never returned. Mm. None of these women have ever turned up dead, alive, or otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of similarities. Last one's in November, not December, but I mean, you're splitting hairs with November. It's, it's is close it, it's, enough. Yeah, it, it's close enough. And the first ones were were younger victims. Yeah. And, and progressively they got older, not not chronologically per se, but uh, yeah. so it could be just he got more comfortable. Right. Or they were just, they're victims of opportunity. Yep, yep. Police haven't said whether these cases are connected, but I felt them relevant to mention for sure. I can see why. Just over four years after Dana's murder, on January 14th, 1986, police announced they'd crack the case. Whoa. A 35-year-old man named David Grant Summerton of Mount Pearl left a note at the post office admitting to Dana's murder. Oh, oh, wow, okay. He was interrogated admitted his guilt to the officers interrogating him and was charged with murder for mm. Dana's death. Yeah, logically. His claim was that he'd killed Dana, buried his black jacket along Maddox Cove Road, and then he'd left his car at a local dump to cover and get rid of the evidence. Okay. I mean, that all sounds right. For six weeks, the police dug in places that Somerton had mentioned, meticulously searching every spadeful of dirt for corroborating evidence. Yeah. They used heavy equipment to unearth cars at the dump, Somerton claimed to be the one where he'd left his car. Yeah. They found nothing. Okay. And the investigation had cost the public half a million dollars. Yeah, well, yeah. The charges were dropped and Somerton, claiming he was badgered into confessing by the cops and now professing innocence, was sent to jail for two years on an obstruction charge. Yeah, uh uh, who was bad? Who is he claiming was badgering him? The police in the interrogation. That's yes. what he's saying. Eh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You left a note and turned yourself in. Right. So yeah, yeah, you're gonna get you're gonna get badgered in an interrogation. But it, the reason that the charges were dropped is because they realized what he was saying was baloney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But he was just one of those people who you hear of who just yeah, yeah. Maybe he had a false memory that he had done mm -hmm. it. It's possible. Or. He was just some ass clown who wanted to make the police run around. I don't know. Yeah, or uh, mentally unwell. Yeah, he was yep. sick in some way. Who yep. knows? Yep. We don't know. Yeah. Dana's family was also harassed a number of times by a late night anonymous caller claiming to have killed Dana. Oh, man. That, oh, that the can, I cannot tell you how much that angers yeah, me. Yeah, right? They suffered enough, you piece of shit. Dana's case remained active over the years and is still open. It's not considered a cold case. Mm, good. Investigators claim they work on it every day. Oh, really? Yep. Oh. And they have tracked over 1,700 tips since 1981. There have been numerous times when police felt they were close to solving the case for one reason or another, but always the lead would evaporate. Mm. In 2016, the DNA from evidence found on Dana's person, probably the hair and maybe some other things, Yeah was tested with the hope of a hit on the National DNA Database, but nothing came up. It has also been used to eliminate many suspects yeah. as well. Yeah, and people, yeah, that's a, we assume, or we always think that DNA is to try to c catch, which it, it is, it, it, a key component for sure, but a lot of the time it is to eliminate suspects. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it should be used to. Yeah. Let's determine who it actually was and who it actually wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Also in 2016, a lot of noise was being made and funds were being raised by a Facebook group full of concerned citizens called Justice for Dana. Okay. They wanted authorities to dig up two abandoned cars buried since the early 80s near Whitless Bay. It was suspected these cars were connected to Dana's murder and buried to hide evidence. Led by a group of forensic specialists, the cars were unearthed in May of 2016. The hope was that the cars would be preserved enough, especially in their trunks, to provide DNA evidence that would link them to Dana Bradley. Yeah, that, that would be the hope. From the group's news release, 
quote, Once the excavation was underway, it became obvious that not only were the vehicles not intact, but they were degraded to such an extent that there was absolutely no possibility of retrieving any type of DNA for analysis or any other type of trace evidence, end quote. Were they still able to identify the cars? They matched the description of those cars. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. were close to. Yeah. Water damage, corrosion, and the facts that the cars have been crushed and scattered meant that no useful evidence could be collected from them. Another dead end. Yeah. Yeah, shitty. There were other Newfoundland murders that had gone a long time without resolution. For example... In 2012, a man named Malcolm Cuff, who had already been doing time for another crime, chose at his parole hearing to admit to murdering 16-year-old Janet Louvel in 1979 near Cornerbrook on the other side of the province from St. John's. He was later convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to another 14 years. Perhaps this is how Dana's story will res resolve as well. You never know. You never know. Yeah. You know, uh, we never thought ear ons would be caught. Right. And, and he was, and yep. so you never know. There are still plenty of rumors about who done it. One keeps popping up. It's a local St. John's man who'd been charged, convicted, and jailed in the 90s for sexual crimes against children, both boys and girls, mm. spanning from 69 to 81. Mm. An anonymous source told me that the rumor is this man has not given a DNA sample to rule himself out. Okay. But we can't confirm that one way or the other, nor do we have any opinion on the guilt or innocence of this person and have no legal reason to name him in connection with the case. Yeah, you know, even just hearing him, I'm a bit skeptical because if the police want your DNA, they'll get your DNA. It'll happen, yeah. You know, it, it'll happen, yeah, they, you know, especially yeah. if you're in prison, they, they, they can exactly. retrieve uh, something that you have thrown out, so. So we'll end this story with a quote from a song called The Ghost of Dana Bradley, and it was written and sung by Newfoundland folk singer mm. Ron Hines. And it goes, I read her name in the Daily News, heard it on the radio, it was on TV. Someone stole her life away, someone still at large, they say, who can he be? And how does he sleep at all? Face to the guilty wall, remembering, remembering. Does her sweet face haunt his dreams, or does he even feel a single thing? Whew. Great lyrics and great questions. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And I'll link to uh, the song on YouTube so folks can listen to it yeah. in the show notes. Anyone with information about Dana's murder should contact the RCMP at 709-772-5400. Or if you wish to remain anonymous, call the Crime Stoppers tip line at 1-800-222-8477. And that's it for this week's episode, uh, Who Killed Dana Bradley? Well, I hope we find out. I would love to find yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, to, yeah, again, I'm trying to put myself in the family's shoes and to just be living your life. It's kind of why I avoid these, these cases because we don't, we just, I feel like we're just left hanging. Well, uh, yeah, and as I mentioned at the beginning, it, we like some, some finality to it, some completion, whether it's um, positive or negative, but... Um, but yeah, there is there is power, and it is important to get these names and cases out there, so yeah. that people can uh, uh, hopefully uh, remember something. Exactly. So let's 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 lighten it up a bit. Oh yes, please. It's time for our Patreon shoutouts. I think we have quite a few today. We do, because yeah. we've, we've been away for a little while. Um, yeah. We did two episodes in one week, so we've been away for essentially two weeks. Yeah. And this week's good eggs are one I think I missed. Oh! And her name was Melissa Doty. Oh. And she's from Grass Valley, California. Wow. And yep. so if we have missed you, if you haven't heard your name in the first month... Yeah. After you've gotten, yeah. if you've become a patron or sent us donut money, send me an email at darkproteinpodcast at gmail.com and say, Mike, hi, I, I think you might have missed me in your Patreon shout outs. Go shit in your hat. You don't necessarily have to say go shit in your hat, but <laughs> what a good thing to say would be, I'd love to hear my name. And it's like, okay. Yeah. And so I'll email you back and say, sure, yep. I'll do that. Yep. And we'll do it in the next episode. So please, if you were, were missed, let us know. Yep. We do want to say your name. <laughs> Thank you to Paula Cassidy Bishop from North Yorkshire, Great Britain, for upping her pledge for huh. real this time. Uh, oh. 
right? Remember? She oh, was that the one where it showed up like seven times or something? No, or? she said uh, she upped it and emailed oh, yes, me and said yes. why, yeah. and she hadn't actually, yeah. but, but now she has. Oh, Thank you to Olivia Graham from Burnaby, BC. Olivia is a very good name. Just got, you beat me to it. Great <laughs> name. I knew you were going to go. Uh, does anybody call you Bibby? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, they should if they don't, Olivia. So thank you, Olivia Graham. Uh, next up is Catherine Dalfond. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Lethbridge. Lethbridge. Yeah, she's from Lethbridge. Alberta. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, not the most exciting uh, city. Okay, but what, does she it, have an exciting job? She does. What is it? Uh, snowmobile repair. Wow. Yeah. So, but is it like mobile snowmobile repair like she goes out into the woods and helps people who get stuck it's not but that's a great idea <laughs> you, you might you might want to look into that yeah it's a good business uh, idea Catherine I that that you you could really help broaden some horizons but the but the most fun part of the job yeah you, you, if you've done some repair you, you got to make sure it works oh there you go so what do you do Let's take it for a spin. You go take it for a spin. That's what my buddy used to do. He, he repaired Porsches. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, he used to have a shop that repaired Porsches and BMWs. Oh. And so he used to take them for a spin. But uh, the snowmobile repair is very lucrative. Because I, 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 I mean, because it's seasonal. Yeah. So she gets, she just gets to take, enjoy, take the summer off. She just gets like, what a job. Man. You get to just enjoy it. Like, yeah, there you go. The summer, yeah. Next up is... Stephanie DeMatteo from Lima, Ohio. Oh, hi, Stephanie. Lima. Thank you. Lima. Lima. Or it might be Lima. I don't know. It pretty, could be Lima Bean. I'm pretty confident it's Lima. Okay. Confident. Jill Bowie from Vancouver, BC. Yes, Jill. Oh, we met her. We did? We did. We met her, and I think I told you the story. She was the one who said, make better faces. Oh, that was her. Yeah, and, and, which cracked me up. I found it hysterical. So I, I made oh, well, I made funny. her a shirt Oh, that says, uh, make better faces, and I will uh, drop it off at some point. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Alora McEwen, also from Vancouver, B.C. Oh, Vancouver in the house. Right? And also another Vancouverite, Alyssa Reddy. Oh, they must have all been at the live show or something. They had to have been. Yeah. But some of these came before the live show. Well, then I don't have an answer. There you go. But awesome. Thank you. Thank you. For showing up, Vancouver. And thank you for showing up at the live oh, show, by God, the way. Yes, thank you. Oh, my God. We had so much fun. <laughs> Patricia Corvo from Pembroke, Ontario. Upped her pledge. Thank you, Patricia. Andrea Savory from St. John's, Newfoundland. Surprise, you get an episode where we talked about your hometown. That's kind of cool. That's right. Yeah, so we did it just for you, Andrea. Well, I don't, did we? No. Oh. I, I, I actually looked at, at the Patreon shout outs afterward and I thought, well, that's ironic. Yeah. It but, is. but there you go. So Andrea probably would have said later on, hey, you guys should cover the case of Dana Bradley. We just beat you to it. Yeah, we just, yeah. we read your mind. We're well, being proactive. Exactly. Shannon Brower from Hebron, Kentucky. Hebron. Right? Shannon, thank you. <laughs> from Hebron. 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 Mel H. from Montreal. And thanks for your only using your last initial as your username and not forcing me to say, Hey, Dar Oglu. There, I said it anyway. Wow. That's her last name, Hey, Dar And you did struggle with it. You had to say it twice. Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, Mel, thank you. Thank you, Mel. Angela Taylor. Yeah. Is she a tailor somewhere, or is she... Mike, just... That, says, that was such an easy out, Mike. Well... No, no, she's not. Okay. She's not. What is she? Uh, she's a juggler. Oh, oh wow. Angela yeah. Taylor is a juggler. She is, and do you know where? What does she... Well, first of all, oh, oh. what does she juggle? What, what doesn't she juggle? But her specialty... Yeah. It is flaming. Okay. Wait, I'm... Yeah. Drum roll. Fla Le flaming legs. But I see. I knew that you would react that way. Human? But no, no, no. Uh, you remember uh, a Christmas story. 
Yes. Remember that lamp that had the. Oh yeah. Like, it, they would be. They were along that line. Oh. Okay. With uh, uh, yeah. So they're not real legs, but they were huge, and she she juggles them like so they'll do eight at a time. Oh, Can wow. you imagine these gigantic? Fragile. Must yeah. be Italian. Hey, <laughs> because he's a size and just juggling those on fire. Yeah. Yeah, she's really really good. Well, good for you, Angela Taylor, the uh, fire leg juggler who is from. Nepal. Nepal. Yeah, she's Nepalese. She's Nepalese. Yeah. Well, fantastic. It is. I agree. Next up, we have Meredith Lapp from Delta, British Columbia. Ooh, just around the corner. Another neighbor. Meredith. Stephanie Enns from Calgary, Alberta. Oh, very close to us-ish. Look at all the Canadians showing up this yeah. week. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty great. It is, because, you know, we're also in Canada. Right? So that's beautiful. And this next one, I have to say with an accent. It's Eliza Farrell from Brooklyn, New York. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah. yeah you went, you went. I'm going to have uh, I'm gonna have a pizza pie. And, uh, <laughs> Stoli. <laughs> something. Wow. Thank you, Eliza Farrell from Brooklyn, New York. Well, wow, that's uh, well done. And I would love to visit Brooklyn, New York. I have never been. I, I, I want to visit New York proper, but... Uh, yeah, I would I would love also to see the boroughs, and, yeah. and I hear Brooklyn is a fantastic place. Yeah. I'd love yeah I'd love to just spend a lot of time. Yeah, in, in the yeah, just like spend a month yeah. around. Is it because it's just it's so vast? There's so many things to do, stuff to see. Yeah, Cindy Olson from Guelph, Ontario, where my dad went to to vet college. Well, hello, Cindy, and thank you. Isn't that cool? It's great. Kira Page from Fayetteville, Arkansas, up to pledge. Well, thank you. Megan McLean, a.k.a. McLeansy, oh. from Warkworth, Ontario, oh. who's and apparently sending us some clothing of some description. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, is that? Okay, yeah. She's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been chatting with her and just... Uh, she's a really great photographer. Oh, really? I haven't been chatting with her at all. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm popular. She, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. She, no, she, uh, yeah. She messaged because she's like, I want to send you guys some. I've met, I've talked to her over uh, Instagram a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's super nice. Great photographer. Hmm. She got herself a, a an adorable little boy oh, and, and a big beefcake husband. Oh. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's quite the life she's got going on over there. I'm just a cake. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, there's no beef. It's just all it's all cake. Delicious. And, oh boy, Aaron Gleason from Ottawa, Ontario. Thank you, Aaron, from our country's capital. That's right, Aaron. And oh, here's one that we love. Yeah, our good pal Danny Zuko from Surrey, BC. There's just something extra special about. Yeah, because we met we met Danny last year. She was going through some stuff, and we we just she, went and you know she, visit she, her. She posted about about this, you know, just about how how she feels like she's it's she's finally able she's finally in a good place and able to yeah to repay. And it's just uh, there's nothing to have to repay. You're a good egg, and yeah. uh, hugs from us. Yeah, just glad you're doing well. Nicholas DeRoche from Ottawa, Ontario. Yeah. Lots of Ontarians. Yeah. Because here's another one. Leah Bradley from Kirkland Lake, Ontario. Another one from Ontario. Right? Leah, Leah, Isn't it bonkers? Leah. And here's one. This one is our friend, mm. Jenica Cabanas. Jenica Cabanas from Jenica Cabana, Cabanas. Wow. Jenica. Wow. Let me do it. Jenica Cabanas, our friend from Toscana, Italy. Nice. She, she shows up for our live show oh, sometimes. Oh, yeah. She yeah. It, She's like... I, I, yeah, I and don't we know. always do this. Hey, it's Roberto Lamonga. Yeah. I stop at the park. <laughs> I'm a goalie. But but she's Filipina from who Which, lives in Italy. Why not? Yeah, exactly. You gotta live somewhere. You gotta live somewhere, and Italy is pretty pretty place to live. Yeah. They make it the goalies. And last but not least, as far as Patreon goes, we have Kristen Stewart. Not to be mistaken for Kristen Stewart. I was going to say. From Cucamonga, California. Oh, oh my God. I can't believe I got to say Cucamonga oh on my the God. show. 
I would that, uh, of all the places that's where I would want to live just so I could say I'm from Cucamonga, Cucamonga. or Chatham, uh, Chattanooga could, I like that as well because it doesn't sound like uh, if you, where are you from I'm from Cucamonga yeah where are you from Cucamonga people would be like it's not real you're not from that's Timbuktu not, that's not too. Real. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so oh. on, on to some donut money oh we got we got quite a bit of donut money this week. Oh, did we? We got a whopper of a donation from our pal Denise Sakaki in oh, Duval, Washington. We got to meet her at a meet and greet. Yeah, that's was right. Just the nicest, nicest person. She said, "Happy 100th episode. About to listen to it now. Sorry to have missed attending the live show, but okay. Team Poutine and everyone in all the yards gave me such joy. Oh. Here's to the first hundred and many more. Cheers. Thank you, Denise. You are a rock and roll star." She is. She really, yeah, she, you, you speak of good eggs, and I remember meeting her and just you know, how hilarious she was and kind. Deborah Kappas Cassidy huh? says, congratulations on reaching 100 episodes. Do something wild to celebrate. How about have a triple-triple with your donuts? Whoa, triple-triple. I'm down. I'll be all lactose intolerant and... What about a quad? I will even go quad-quad. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. Here's a note from Carolyn Daly, who sent us some donut money. She said, happy 100 episodes, gents. Congratulations on all the wonder th- wonderful things thus far, as you and am sure. Uh, and, uh, okay. Congratulations on all the wonderful things that have come thus far for you, and I'm sure there are plenty more afoot. Thank you for doing what you do and entertaining my brain 100 times. <laughs> One American dollar for every time. If I could deliver it in pennies in a wheelbarrow, I would. <laughs> and you could keep the wheelbarrow scoffed. <laughs> P.S. Love the Harry Houdini episode, Mike. All the best. Lots of love. And donuts from Colorado to you both. Carolyn Daly. Thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn. That is just so sweet of you. And I could use a wheelbarrow. <laughs> you don't have one currently, I, I think. I don't. No. So that would just work out. Camilla Moir sent some donut money with a note. And she said, hey, guys, it's Dr. Moir in Japan. Sorry it took so long to donate. She is the one who talked to us about uh, Granger Taylor, I do believe. Yes, okay, I remember. Uh, We postdoc physicists have fancy titles but are pretty poor. (laughs) You can use this money for donuts or to finance your search for the plutonium core. (laughs) She just rapped, too. (laughs) Right? I'm not not sure if you're aware, Dr. Moir. You just rapped. <laughs> she did rap. A great rap. And thank you so much. Our pal Lorian Barnard sent us a nice bit of cash with a note. Congratulations on 100 episodes. Thank you for giving me something to look forward to every week and being all around fantastic people with a fantastic podcast. Happy face with love hearts around it. XOX. Lorian the noise lady. Yeah, and she really is. Well, she really is. I'd love to meet her one day. Yeah, same here. Uh, I really wish I could have when I was in Australia. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a, bloody da- work it's a bloody damn big continent, and I didn't realize that. So, <laughs> exactly, it's huge. It is. I thought it was small. Monet Terrio sent us some more donut money. She loves us. Monet. <laughs> She's fantastic. I have to rename the show after her. And here's another one. Uh, bef- the last of the penultimate one so the f- one before the last okay. this is says hey guys love the podcast keep up the good work oh and go Bruins Dakota from Vermont oh that was a mixed uh... <laughs> so we were all excited until the Bruins yeah you really nah whatever you really built us up and then chopped us down <laughs> we there we totally did wow I'm getting fat with all this love wow but ugh. <laughs> but here's my favorite one for inside reasons please accept this donut money on account of I'm a jack wagon signed Melissa Doty aka the accidental bad apple oh okay. and that's that's an inside joke okay between her and I <laughs> okay yeah oh I'm, I, wow and now my curiosity is peaked but oh, uh, we'll talk about it offline yeah well, but, that, well, but she you. can be the mystery jack wagon forever. Oh God, what a great name! That is the mystery Myst- jack. Wagon. Myst- it's not. It's like the mystery machine yeah. on Scooby Doo. That's the mystery jack wagon. <laughs> mystery jack wagon. Maybe that's if, if I get my wheelbarrow. That's what I'll call it. The mystery jack wagon. Yeah, I'll just name it Jack Wagon. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, we did get some uh, real, like, live things from yes. people this week. Yes. 
And one of the first up was from Moscow. Yep. Dina, D- Dina yeah. Levina. Yeah. Who is at Dina Levine Arts on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Sent us an awesome painting. She does uh, another awesome person I chat yeah. with. She does just unbelievable or I love her the comics that she makes yeah it's cool I I told I laugh at them a lot like I yeah. always met uh, mention them on on Instagram and yeah I think she sucked all the creativity out of Moscow I think she has it all sure she has she's taken all the creativity and, and is creating awesome comics with it I mentioned in our Facebook post about it that yes we now have colluded with the Russians <laughs> This is true. And, and, and a great person, too. Really wonderful person. Last but not least, our, our two new friends from Spring Hill, Nova Scotia, Sarah and Daryl Potter. They oh, sent us, yes. They sent us some a little bit of donut money. They sent us jam. I, which I'm looking at. Which is wild blueberry. One, one jam, a jar for, of wild blueberry each. Yep. And a jar of wild strawberry jam each. And if you've never had wild berries, yeah. they are the most amazing tasting berries ever. Have you tried the jam yet? Yes, I had. And? Uh, amazing. Okay. Like, really, I'm, really just, I'm just staring at it now, and we'll be putting some on a bagel later. And they sent us some chips, too. Uh, covered yes, rich potato yes. chips, which are also amazing. Yeah, yeah. He made sure uh, made sure Mike doesn't eat them all and gives you a bag. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah I see. I'm, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was pretty fantastic to get like a, a couple of little gifts and yeah. people have been asking me for a P.O. box which I am now finally going to get. Well like I said that uh, Meg is sending us some 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 gear. <laughs> oh boy. Well not night like, not underwear I don't think. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to model anything like that. Oh we still yeah you still do. <sighs> Just for my, my collection. Anyway, thanks so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. It doesn't matter how you support us. We love it. We love all the stuff that we got this week. What an amazing amount of love we got after our live show. Yeah. Thank you so much. If you want to help support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark poutine or for one-time support, you can send us some donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show. You can easily find us on iTunes, Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Give us a like or a follow on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. We're even on Snapchat, but I haven't really done anything (laughs) there. Most importantly, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And before we go... Here's a promo from the super well-produced new podcast called Crime Machine. I love it. Crime Machine is a true crime podcast created by our buddy Jack Luna, formerly of Dark Topic and Monstro, and his pal Sam Swenson. Each week, Mr. Luna sets off on a dangerous journey into the heart of history's worst crimes, a task undertaken with the help of our trusty operator and his Crime Machine effect. And the promo is about three minutes long, but it's Stick worth it. it's yeah. worth listening to. And I'm I'm totally looking forward to what they're going to do with oh, this show. Sammy, crime machine, crime machine, <laughs> friendly neighborhood crime machine. Exactly. I think that's the promo. Anyways, it, uh, I can't wait to check out the show. Yeah. So here it is. Operator, we have a confirmed location on Mr. Luna. Oh, hello there. Welcome to Crime Machine. I am the operator, and your timing is impeccable. Mr. Luna has just returned. Oh, God. Okay. That's a wrap there, man. That was horrible. Uh, you know what? I might have to go back for a minute. Do I have all my limbs? God knows nobody else does back there. Oh, uh, Mr. Luna, th- these are our first guests. 
Maybe you could explain to them a little... This has uh, changed everything, this crime machine. It's like a time machine, but for crime. Mr. Loon thought that would be a clever name. I wasn't sure anyone would understand what it... They get it. Relax. So, okay, for example... We all think we know Eileen Warnos, but we've never spent much time in the woods with her as a girl. The Manson murders are well documented, but never has anyone sat with Charlie as he waited for his disciples to return from the Helter Skelter. This podcast will take you there, to moments in time within crime. Moments in crime, how about? Dinner with Dahmer or, or breakfast with Bundy? Yeah, yeah, a BLT for brunch with BTK. Crime Machine puts a microscope on the moments in crime that are often glazed over, steps away from the bird's eye view typical of most true crime pods, and puts a section into a fishbowl to be thoroughly examined. And it's not just serial killers we're revisiting here. We have ghost stories rooted in truth, alien abduction claims that will make grizzled cross-country truckers pull over for the night. Crime Machine helps us to view the story from a fresh angle, as a fly in the wall, enables us to provoke said walls to finally speak. This is not a fictional podcast, by the way. It's just a fresh take on the true crime genre, which, let's be honest, is a little oversaturated. Crime Machine rings it out a bit. Crime Machine has returned to optimal temperature. Mr. Luna, it appears we have completed cooldown. Are you ready to enter Crime Machine? Oh, I am. But are they? Crime Machine is a true crime podcast written by Jack Luna and produced by Sam Swenson. Subscribe to Crime Machine wherever you consume your podcasts and remember to tell everyone what you heard here today. Do you love us or wanting to hear more Crime Machine than everyone else? You can support Crime Machine on Patreon. Become a member by searching for Crime Machine on Patreon or by going to patreon.com or slash crime machine. And that's it. Wow. Love it. Crazy. Love it. Until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.